On June 3rd, the LFA featherweight belt is up for grabs. And today I am talking to the next featherweight champion of LFA, Mr. Michael Stack. Mike, how are you doing, man? Thanks for being here. Hey, man, I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. Look forward to the show, dude. We have been putting questions out there, and I've been typically doing this at the end, but I'm going to move it up to the front. And here are some questions that are urgent for you to respond to. But before I do, you guys, like, how'd you get started in MMA? Or do you like Holly Holm or Vieira? Like, you guys need to work your game. I'm not asking boring crap like that. So I threw all those questions away. I kept the dope questions. I included some of my uh, own. Question number one, Scott Coker versus Dana White in a cage fight. Who do you got and why? Uh, I think Dana White, man, to be honest with you. And I'm not just saying that because I think the promotion is better. I just think Dana could probably take Coker. <laughs> okay, so like just by like a knockout, huh? Uh, I think you probably out. I think Dana White probably has better cardio than uh, – not Coker, to be honest. I, I, it, you know what? I think it looked like a Dada five thousand versus Kimbo Slice. It probably looked very reminiscent of that. Uh, it's possible Coker might stroke out and have a heart attack before like <laughs> three minutes into the first. It's certainly possible. Second question: Is there a unwritten rule book amongst fighters that only fighters would know about? Or- hmm. I think um, once you start getting to a higher level in training, mm-hmm. you start to realize that not every si- single sparring uh, session needs to be an all-out war. Um, it doesn't have to be like, I'm going to knock you out every practice, right? So when you're with your partners, you're supposed to take care of, stay, take care of your partners, you know? Um, so I think that is maybe not necessarily an unwritten rule because not everybody – understands that but once you start getting to a higher level you develop and mature as a fighter uh you start training smarter and that that comes with experience if some guy wants to like glove tap with you and you don't are you kind of a jerk if you don't tap gloves um depends where you're talking about are you talking about before the fight after the fight during the fight okay so Uh, but you're qualifying it so um i i that's a that's a question unto itself. So you put certain qualifications out there in your mind, Mike, like when is it okay to touch gloves? And then like, like when would it be expected to touch gloves, like in a sporting way? And then for you, like what's just kind of out of bounds? Like, no, I'm not doing that. Look, uh, when I'm in the cage and the referee is facing us off and he says, touch gloves and come out fighting. That's the time you touch gloves. So if uh, my opponent wants to touch gloves right then, that's when I'm touching your gloves. After we've gone to our corners and it's time to, you know, get to business, at that point, I'm not touching your gloves because I'm focused on um, punching your face. And now I'm not touching your glove because I have any issue with you. I'm just not touching your glove because I'm focused on beating your ass and not getting my ass beat, right? So, um, but, you know, there's times in, in a fight where, uh it's a great fight the dudes have been blasting each other beating each other up and they're both appreciating it and one of them will in an initiate a uh a like a like a glove tap or like a hug or something and hey man i if you feel compelled to do so i have no problem with it but uh for me personally i haven't experienced that yet in a fight i don't think i would be opposed to it um but really uh when i'm in the cage i'm there for business and uh, the business is not done until, you know, the fight's over or you're on the sleep, you know, on the canvas sleeping. So, I mean, it's a brutal sport, dude. Uh, I don't have any problem with these guys. And, you know, I've never had any issues with anyone or any kind of beef before uh, a fight. And I'm, you know, I'm glad kind of, I guess. I mean, I, it's business, man. I'm here to make money and further my career. I was thinking to myself, and I said this to a Bellator fighter recently, because I asked him, I was like, have you ever had to fight somebody you genuinely didn't like? And he was like, uh, not really. He's like, there have been a couple guys I didn't really care for, but like, no one's really got under my skin yet. I'm like, okay, pretend that you're about to fight somebody that really has got under your skin. He's like, okay. I'm like, before the fight, like, 
have you ever thought about like maybe not showering for a couple days like just being fucking right when you get in there and he's like dude i didn't really think about that but now that you mention it he's like i think i might resort to that so that's not really a question that's i guess that's more of a comment something to think about moving forward maybe get a little right strategy. yeah you know just kind of be like a freaking nasty uh well i know your daughter's there so i won't swear but a nasty you know what uh you know just oh you know, uh, She's out over there playing off in the uh, in the gravel. So you're more be a nasty ass, be disgusting, be fucking gross, be ripe. I'm just saying, I'd give them you know that old like middle school locker room treatment before like you know everyone knew you like yo put on pit stick. You're fucking gross. You know one of those numbers. Yeah, you know, uh, I have <laughs> you know a weird uh, thing I I've noticed in a fight is I I've. Uh, fought this dude we were fighting and then we clinched up got into the cage and i noticed that he had smelt like nice in a in a not uh <laughs> sus way at all but i was like oh, he smells fresh this guy like he's got some decency to uh not smell like an ape while i'm you know i'm him over here you know what uh a little bit of etiquette uh pays off thank you guys for being hygienic uh, you know, I'm sure the referee thanks you guys for that. Mike, I want to go ahead and shift gears a little bit. And I want to talk just about you as a fighter. Um, you're a guy that I've been watching for the past couple of years. You've been in LFA for a while and you've turned pro and you've been very, very active since you've been on the pro circuit. You have a seven in one record. Again, you're a guy that fights very, very frequently, but you've started this chapter of your career in the world of the pandemic where things have been going crazy. Bouts mm -hmm. are falling off left and right. There are different precautions that have to happen. Um, you're not always able to fight in front of a live crowd. Just like when you think about all that stuff, and this has been going on for the past two and a half years, has, is it going to be like weird or an adjustment of sorts when things quote unquote go back to normal and we're able to like, pack arenas and stuff again well my last fight with kyle was uh it was full arena again um and that was my first fight back uh to having fans really let's see because the no 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 actually uh jackson philo had fans too jackson kyle the last two had fans i gotta be honest with you i don't notice a difference i i don't pay attention to uh um fans in the arena I am like focused on what I have to do. The last two fights that I had, the fans were back. Kyle uh, in New York, and then I fought Jackson Philo up, up in Vail, and we had all the fans back. I don't notice, you know. I mean, I notice it when I'm walking out and people are screaming my name and stuff like that. But when I'm in the cage, I don't notice it at all. I, I'm focused on the task at hand. And, um, you know, I think maybe that would be different at – a higher level where this the you know the numbers are bigger of people in the in this in the in the stands and whatnot but even at in the ufc they got guys fighting at the uh the apex. Youth, the apex center and that's barely full right mm -hmm. i mean like they, i don't know how many what their capacity is that there but it's it's not like minimal yeah yeah i'm <laughs> sure it's not even as big as uh when i fought kai and uh, Kyo and uh, Jackson Philo, right? So absolutely. I, I I ask the question because I've always been curious, like your ability to like hear your coaches when you are fighting with no crowd versus with the crowd, um, and and just able to like receive those instructions and hear what they're saying. Um, some guys don't have a problem because like they're trained to like hear their coach. I know it sounds weird to people who don't fight, but that's very much a thing um, for you. Is like, is that, is that, has that ever been like an issue? No, I hear my, I hear my coach, um, me and my coach, my head coach, Ryan Schultz, we have a really good uh, connection as far as like friendship, not only, you know, as a fighter coach relationship, but we're friends outside. Uh, he's helped me with more than just fighting. He's helped me in so many different ways that uh, I respect him. I admire him. I look up to him in, in a lot of ways. And um, because of that, uh, our friendship and our bond, I think um, when I'm in those situations where like, 
things are going crazy. I'm in a fight. Mm -hmm. I know I can hear him and pay attention to what's going on. Right. And, and do what he is asking you to do, whatever adjustments he sees, you're able to hear those instructions and then execute on them in real time. Um, that is what separates a good fighter from a great fighter. Like you have to be able to like make those in-ring adjustments as they're happening. And when your coach sees something, immediately apply that. Some guys are better at listening than others. Watch the UFC fights tonight. It'll be in the apex. You, you'll, you'll be able to distinguish the difference. Talk about you stylistically. And I think what makes you a very dangerous guy to have to fight is you're very good at a lot of different things. Your striking stands out to me. You're very aggressive. You level change really well. Your clinch game is really, really good. Um, the few times I've seen you get put on the clinch, you're able to dig for hooks, reverse position, dirty box, knee somebody, or uh, or get the fight down to the ground and ground and pound them. Like You're good in all these different areas of the game. Is there one area when you got started into the pro level that you really put an emphasis on in your game? Um, you, you seem to do everything so well, but not everybody like comes from like necessarily a jiu-jitsu background or a wrestling background. So for you, what element of your game in mixed martial arts did you really like put an emphasis on? Every part of the game. I, I feel like, and I appreciate you saying that you think I'm good in all these areas, but for me, I feel like I'm not to where to the level that I want to be I want to be perfect in every aspect mm -hmm. of the game it's, you know uh striking jujitsu when I go up against these black belt uh jujitsu guys I'm like damn I, I need to be I I know areas in jujitsu that I need to work on and so I work on them um in my striking I know there's areas in striking that I need to work on my wrestling my clinch I know my weaknesses in each of the areas mm -hmm. and I try maximize that like maximize my abilities in each of those areas so you know i, I kind of think of like this is my personality when i was a kid you remember those pokemon games those game boy pokemon games yeah well i knew guys they would train one pokemon right all the way to the max level and all the other ones would be at you know a little level right, so they had right. one really great one my my style has always been train them all you know to the highest that they can be and then when you're ready to hit that level go there right so if, if the next uh gym that i had to fight you needed pokemon at like a 40 40 percent level or whatever all of them were there not just the one right so uh that's kind of just what i like doing i just like i want every area to grow together. I think you've been able to uh, demonstrate your growth in all facets of mixed martial arts. One of the things that is so interesting, like it's hard for me to like wrap my head around the fact that you only have been fighting for the amount of time that you have been. It's not very long. You started your AMI career in 2016 and mm -hmm. you went pro a couple years later in 2018 and the guys that you fought in the short amount of time, you fought Kai Kamaka, who's an absolute savage and only your fifth pro fight. I, I, I just think like, I take a step back. I'm like, wow, like he is already fighting at some of the highest level guys that just haven't gotten called up yet. Now Kai has obviously since got called up and now here you are seven and one and you have a title fight on your hands. So I have to ask, you're a guy that doesn't lose and you've lost one time. It was against Kai. Can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to apply what that loss taught you over the course of the most recent bouts? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, I've started my MMA career in 2016. I've been training since 2013. Uh, I went to Colorado State University and uh, that's so after I graduated high school, I was like, man, should I go to college? Should I not? So I ended up going to Colorado State University. That's where I ran into trials, mixed martial arts up here in Fort Collins and met Ryan Schultz. Um, the way everything worked out, it was just supposed to be that way. But I was training off and on because uh, I didn't have a whole lot of money. I was a broke college kid, um, didn't have transportation. So off and on from 2013 to about 2016 i was in and out of the gym then 2016 i i 
hunkered down and I said, this is what I'm doing. And I committed pretty much full time at that point. Um, so yeah, man, there was a lot of, uh, there's, I, I've always been a fighter, like a good fighter. Uh, but I haven't been a mature fighter always. So that loss to Kai, uh, I just was still, in my opinion, a little immature in my fighting knowledge. Uh, and, and, and I mean, we, you're always growing. Like even now, I don't think I'm the most mature fighter and I don't think there's nothing more that I can learn. There's always tons and tons that I can learn. But when I fought Kai, I didn't put the whole game together like I should have. I didn't, uh, you know, he was beating me in the first round with his striking. I adjusted and started whooping his ass in the second round with my striking, dirty boxing, uh, clinching and stuff like that. And then I kind of got into that rut where I'm winning and he adjusted one more time. And when he adjusted, he took me down and, and uh, granted he didn't do anything with the takedown, but I didn't do anything either. And Hey man, that you, you lose. I, I did more damage in my opinion to that, to him than he did me. I almost put him out. He didn't do that to me, but he adjusted and his game plan, uh, you know, he found a way to win. Whereas I, you know, I look at that and then he, he goes and fights in the UFC a week or two weeks later after that fight gets fight of the night, $50,000 bonus and all that. We, we were fight of the year nominated for our fight that night. And so that was kind of like a, a bummer to me, but it also is a blessing in disguise. Like, Hey man, maybe I wasn't ready. I wasn't mature enough at that time to jump into the UFC. However, now, uh, all two years later, after working on all those things, training at different gyms um, and just growing as a fighter. I believe that I'm ready and I know that I'm ready to be in the UFC and not only get into the UFC, but maintain a position in the UFC. And that's, that's an important piece. Okay. Cause like, Hey, yeah, it's a, it's a feat in itself to get to the UFC, but it ain't that cool because how many guys have gone in and out of the UFC that you don't even know their names, right? There's a lot. So I want to get there. I want to make waves and I want to stay there and I want to be on top. And that's, that's where I'm now uh, as a fighter maturing and understanding the game a little bit different. If that makes sense. It totally makes sense. Do you feel like it's one of those situations where you see guys that maybe get ahead of the curve before their time? Uh, and what I mean by that is, like, for example, they bite off more than they can chew and they find themselves in the UFC. They're like your age or maybe they're a little bit younger. And, it, and then it's like, well, holy shit, now I have to fight a guy who's like 33 years old. He's been in this game for a long time. Yeah, you tore it up on the regional scene, but now you're fighting like the best of the best and you're on a four fight skid before you're even 30. And then the game's done with you. It's crazy. Like, have you seen that type of stuff? Do you know guys that have like maybe bit off more than they could chew ahead of their time? I have seen some guys uh, that they were, you know, their records were great. They were beating guys like on the regional scene, like you said, but they were beating guys that were not very good. They were, you know, they're getting finishes and they're beating guys that have terrible records or just terrible skill level. What the UFC is doing, because they're a business at the end of the day, and they're in an entertainment business, right? Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're looking for guys that are finishing. So if you have a ton of finishes on your record, but you fought nothing but tomato cans, they'll put you, they'll sign you. And then when you compete against another guy who has maybe half as many finishes, but he's fought tough, tough competition, then all of a sudden you're beating, you're fighting guys that are at these hot, this high level competition and you're not winning. And it's kind of a reality check. Whereas right. I think I was able to understand that on that fifth fight, like you said, where, Hey man, I, when it comes to toughness, I think I'm tougher and better than Kai. He, he used the game a little bit more than I did in that and, and won that fight, which was a learning, a great learning experience for me. And uh, might've been a blessing in disguise because who knows if I would have been ready for the competition in the UFC when I, cause I think I might've actually gotten to the UFC after that fight, if I had won it. I think you so. would have, I think you would have. And, and I think you hit on something that was really important. It was things happen for a reason. It didn't really go my way, but I could only imagine 
one of the difficult things about being a fighter would be, at least to me, I'm not speaking for you. I'm trying to imagine a scenario in which I was a fighter, but it would be not buying into your own hype and staying humble um, because we live in an age of like social media, right? Like everyone's on fight pass. Everyone can like easily watch your fights. It's not like what it was 10 or 15 years ago, where if you fought on the regional scene, unless you happen to live in that area and buy a ticket, like I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know who you were. There wasn't, there isn't UFC fight pass and there are only a handful of pay-per-view events a year. And like, you might get one UFC fight a month, maybe. So like, it was very, very different back then. And now it's so easy to get your name out there. It's so easy to like, kind of like buy into everything or buy into your own hype. And I think you see that. And I think for me, staying humble would be kind of difficult to do. Um, and, and, and can you talk a little bit, like, how are you able to like kind of ground yourself? Does that come to like surrounding yourself with like the right people or is it just uh, going to your gym and just like fighting like the toughest dudes and like intentionally getting your ass whipped? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, you look at uh, these guys on uh, when they're doing these promotions on UFC and stuff like that, they look phenomenal. They look unbeatable, right? Mm-hmm. But they, when they're hard, that they're not. They know that the guys that they're training with are, are sometimes beating them in rounds or taking their, taking their liver, you know what I mean? Like just mm-hmm. engaging. For example, you look at that guy, he, it seems like he's never getting beat, but he pays $500 to anyone that can uh, land a hardcore liver shot on him, right? And so he knows that he's not, he's not invincible. He knows that um, there's all sorts of risk in this sport, and there is. Um, at the end of the day, man, it's a fight, and anything can happen, right? So I think, yeah, I think – it is easy to get uh, on your hype train. It's right. easy to uh, want to believe that. And it, but you know, this sport is one where you can't get on that because if you do, you'll get humbled, humbled quick. You know, I think, I think no matter what, it's going to come catch up to you, even the best. You know, I th- no matter- and I would also say uh, the reverse is true too. If you struggle a little bit um, or if you get blasted, like, of course, every asshole in the world is going to let you know that, hey, man, you lost you lost that fight. Like, I'm going to type and to let you know, like, I'm going to give you all kinds of shit about it. Like just starting a show, dude, just starting a show and having uh, fighters like you come on and putting myself out there as a, just a regular dude who just likes MMA. Like people have opinions and they're going to let you know what those opinions are. Oh, and, and dude, like, it's like, you're too fat. You're too bald. You, your tattoos suck. Like you're weird. I don't like you. And I'm just kind of like, God damn, you guys are like pointing out all these things about me that I didn't even know about me. Um, right. and, and, and I'm not even an athlete. So it's like one of those things where it's like, when you put yourself in like the public sphere, you almost have to like, kind of like put this armor on and, um, it's just kind of wild to like when you can't get too high, you can't get too low. It seems right. So to balance, you know, you have to be your own best uh, cheerleader. Yeah. Right. Have your own. You have to have confidence. You have to go in there knowing who you are, um, but at the same time, not let your ego take you too high to where the fall is going to be too too big. You know what I mean? Right. But where is the? Here's the thing: is how do you walk that balance? Where do you find the line? How do you uh, walk it so that you are doing it all the time correctly? And maybe you don't, you know, maybe sometimes you slip slip down. Who knows? But uh, it is one of those things. It's part of the entire entire game of MMA, life in general, where you just got to balance every, everything, you know? But the fact that you're cognizant of that just shows that, you have what it takes mentally to like get at the highest level of the sport. The fact that you're already aware of this, this isn't news to you. You've already thought about all these things. Those are the types of things that are going to like, those are prerequisites in my opinion. to like fighting at the very, at the highest of the high level, like everyone in the cage is a savage. Everyone's good. Everyone knows Muay Thai. Everyone knows Jiu Jitsu. It's, 
but it's like it's like the, uh, the other intangibles like what are you doing outside of the cage to get ready are you more confident going in is your conditioning better like there're just all these little things and you perfect the little things and you know you're you're golden no i agree man and i think uh on not getting built up on your own hype i think one thing you just kind of hit on it a little bit is to your preparation yeah. like you have confidence in yourself you will be confident in your abilities if you are preparing correctly. If you are at the gym getting better and you know you're getting better and you're putting the, the work in, that's going to build the confidence. And that's not, in my opinion, uh, prideful or being like egotistical. That's, right. hey, man, I earned. I earned confidence, right? Now, when you start becoming to a point where like, uh, I'm, a, I'm the shit and everybody else beneath me and that type of stuff. I don't care who you are. No one's beneath you. Like we're all on the same uh, level playing field as human beings. Hey. Now when it, sports and athletics are, uh, you know, like how much you can earn or your careers and things that's competitive and it's dependent on what you're, what you put in. But as human beings, you know, nobody is better than any other person. Nobody's life is worth more than the other. Um, you know, we all make mistakes and the way I believe as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, like we all need to be saved. So uh, I don't think anyone is a, above another person, but we have, we do earn uh, certain things. Like I earned my confidence to know that I, I'm a good fighter and I think some of it's God given gifts as well and talents so that everybody else has. There's things that you can do. I can't do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of like my philosophy on it. I don't know. Yeah. I can't say certain though. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think. It's the well, I think it's one of those things like, yes, I do believe that like imbued upon us all are like attributes and whether it's like physical talents or, or art or whatever the case may be. But the common denominator is the sweat equity that you have into whatever your trade is. Right. I think that's key. And at your level, I, I actually no, I won't I won't quite say that. Um, let, let me rephrase. What I'm trying to get at here is at a certain level of MMA, you can get by on just your skill. Like, like you're good, you're you you have these God-given talents to uh bang better than like 98% of the populace. And you're fighting hobbyists, you're fighting guys that aren't really, they're doing it for beer money or whatever the case may be. You may not have to work as hard if you're not serious about the sport. You could probably get by on just being a naturally gifted athlete. But there comes a point in time where you're going to get to the levels that you're fighting at, which is the highest level. You know, you're talking about a triple A promotion, just a, a, a smidge below UFC, right? So at your level, it's like, just your God-given gifts aren't good enough. Like, you know, if you put the work in or not before you go into that cage and before you're getting ready to like put it all on the line, you might like go on a podcast and say, bro, this is the best, most hardcore camp of my entire life. But like when you shaved in the mirror uh, and you were looking at yourself in the mirror, you fucking knew you didn't put in the work. You fucking knew you did. You knew you didn't cut how you should have cut. You knew that you could have done a little bit more, but you dogged it and now you had to live with it and hopefully it's enough. And I just think it's one of those things where it's like, you have to be able to like, this has to be your passion. Like you can't, um, there isn't really room for anything else to like get to where you want to go. If you're that serious about it. Absolutely, dude. I, I 100% agree. Like this sport, uh, I mean, if you're training three times a day, you're exhausted. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I can imagine. <laughs> you meals in. You got to make sure that you're sleeping right. You got to make sure that you're recovering right. Um, you know, uh, there's not much more to think about when you're competing. Like, it's pretty much fighting. Uh, if you got some free time, you sh normally I like to spend it with my family or I like to be uh, – you know, there are times you need to absolutely take your mind off fighting. So, no, you're right, dude. It uh, Most of the time, it's all fighting nonstop. Yeah. You look at my stuff. I don't have a bunch of bikini on my, my phone. I'm looking at dudes beat each other up with their 
you know, in their underwear. <laughs> hey, hey, we got something in common. Me too. Uh, my, that is exactly uh, my life. Um, I have a regular job, but like when I'm not doing my regular job, when I'm not spending time with my family, and my kids, I'm watching like, you know, three quarter naked guys like fight each other more. <laughs> and, and that's like my hobby. And that's a strange hobby now that I like am articulating it. it. When you put it that way, it's a little strange. But yeah, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a little sus. That's definitely for sure, Mike. Only that, only in that way. If you say it, <laughs> cage fighting, it's way cooler. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I'll edit all that out. Cage fighting. Yeah, I'm alpha. So, Mike, you obviously, when I think about it, it's like, wow, here we are, so early on in your career, and you already have an opportunity to take on a very, very difficult opponent in a very high profile fight. I know you've headlined fights before previously in your professional and amateur career, but like none of the stages have been as big as the one that you're about to find yourself on, on June 3rd. I know that oftentimes I'll talk to guys and they'll be like, you know what, dude, it's just any other fight. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to do what it is I need to do. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to try to like, keep my, keep my nose in my work and not really think too much of it and just kind of focus on me. Right. I've also talked to other fighters like, Oh yeah, it's a huge fight. I'm, I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm kind of nervous about it, but I'm confident that you'll see the best version of me when I actually get out on the cage. So putting everything in perspective out there, as you approach this fight and knowing just kind of how close you are to getting a call to go on the contender series, to getting a call to uh, just like, yo, can you make 45? Okay, cool. We need a 45 or get in here. Knowing how close you are and how much this fight means, how do you approach it compared to some of your other ones? I believe this is the most uh, prepared that I, like, I've been for a fight. I, uh, I realized the magnitude of this fight. Um, and I know that it's a huge opportunity and, uh, uh, a great opportunity. Like I'm so appreciative of it. Um, when I first, uh, you know, found out the opponent, um, you know, knowing that he's a tough guy, I was like, this is a tough dude. This dude is going to bring it. And I have to go to a place where I know I am, I'm going to, uh, outwork, outlast, um, prepare myself for an all out war in there. And, uh, you know, if it goes all 25 minutes, I have to know that I'll be in there all 25 minutes. Even if I'm beat the shit up, I can handle it. Right. Um, so that, you know, that gives you, gets you nervous. Don't get me wrong. There are times where I've woke up and I'm like, Holy shit. Like I need to be prepared, but that's what motivates you to get in the fucking gym, get in there and get your work, you know? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to waste this opportunity. I don't want to let this opportunity slip through my fingers. Like I've worked, uh, um, really, you know, since I decided I wanted to fight in high school, I've, I made that decision. Like all the things that I've done, the decisions that I've made all the way up to this point in my life have kind of, uh, I've made be a fighter. So, you know, all those decisions and all the things that I've given up this this opportunity is my shot to, to move forward. And, um, I'm not going to waste that shit, you know? Uh, but yeah, do I, do, do I get nervous sometimes? Not now. I'm not. When I first started training, I was a little nervous. I, and that motivated me to get in there. But now I know like if we're going to have a fucking war and I'm ready for it and I'm not fucking going to quit. And, that's all I need to care about. I don't think about like wins or lose losses. Like when I do think about it, I think myself, I visualize myself winning, but uh, I'm prepared for fucking pain. And that's what I, that's what, if I'm confident that I can endure the pain of the fight, that's all I need. And that's, that's really what I, I expect out of this guy. I think he brings some pressure, dude. Um, you know, I don't know necessarily how much pain he put on his opponent last fight, but he put pressure on it. And just knowing the way that I fight a guy that puts pressure on me is going to fucking get in a fist fight with me. Like we're banging, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I'm going to put pressure. I'm going to put pressure back and we're going to see whose pressure breaks first. And so I know 
that is what's coming in this fight. Uh, I think stylistically, it's a good matchup for an entertaining fight. Um, granted, I'm going to do what I need to do to win. The fight. If I have to fucking uh, sit on your ass and like punch you or whatever, like if it's a boring fight and I, but I, I got to win it. I do what I got to do to win it. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want a boring fight, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to be stupid in the fight. But as far as when it comes to the pain aspect and things like that, if he does bring that, I have it. I, it's, it's there. I, I will bring it back, and I think I will I will beat him. Your you opponent, um, looking at him, and for those who don't know, uh, Mike is fighting Jose Delano. He's 10 and 2. A very young guy. Um, a lot of people think very, very highly of him. Um, and, and I throw myself in that mix. I've seen him fight before. Um, I did the, the first time I saw him was in March of 2022. Um, he put on an, a profess, uh, unimpressive performance. And and this is kind of a shitty thing to say, but I'm not. I, I don't ever lie. I I I, I speak the truth. Um, I do think it's fair if you're going to critique this guy, maybe a little bit. Uh, I think that 10 and two record is maybe a little uh, it's a little misleading. Um, You start digging into like who this guy's fought, how long he's been fighting. Yeah. 10 and two looks good, but I don't think the, the caliber of opponents is quite what yours is. Um, He, he, he fought a lot of guys that were in the red. He's fought some 500 guys um, and, you know, not taking anything away from him. I don't know how it works in Brazil, Um, He has proven himself against highly uh, skilled opponents. He just did it in March. Is that like kind of a fair assessment that this guy, yeah, he's talented, but um, he really hasn't fought anybody like you before. Is that, I know that sounds generic, but would you agree with that statement? I'll I'll tell you this was a little bit more nervous to fight Kyle than I was him. Mm -hmm. When I watch his film, I wasn't impressed with certain things that he was doing in the sense like where like I was like, Oh, that, that scares me here. And when I say scare, like it's I, good. Yeah. It's a good thing. You know what I mean? Like I, like there's certain guys where you're about to fight them and you get a little tingle in your fucking nuts and you're like, shit. Yeah. I'm, just gonna be, I'm, I'm in for a battle here. You know what I mean? It's like one of those, it's, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it besides that. Yeah. Um, with him, I had to look at his fight style and then and like realized, oh, he's a pretty smart fighter. Uh, because I think he is. I think he is a uh he's a pressure fighter, uh, from what I saw. Do I think he's fought the kind of caliber that I am? I don't think he has he's fought anyone that will put the pressure like I have, that's for sure. Uh and I'm mean when I fight. Cause I've been, I've been in a lot of, uh, you know, I was, I've been in a lot of street fights and like, I'm not a dirty fighter, but like in a street fight and I'm sure he has too, but like, you got to fight for your life sometimes, you know what I mean? And, uh, um, I look at losing in there as like, I look at losing in there, like as in a different way, like it, it can be fucking really serious. You know what I mean? Um, granted, Maybe that's not the right way to think about it. Sometimes maybe that can put too much pressure on you. I don't know. Uh, I just know I look at things differently, and I think I have a good mindset for uh, competition. I have said this to a couple of different people, <laughs> and I uh, I was I, I'll tell you because you'll laugh and think it's funny. Um, when I think of all the people in LFA right now, the person who fucking terrifies me the most it's you by a lot. Like you're in the cage, I, that version of you. If I had to fight you, like I, dude, like you're you're pretty intimidating and pretty fucking scary. Like when you're in there, like now you're just a normal dude. But like, there's a different side of you uh, that uh, is absolutely terrifying. And like, you were really pissed off because your last opponent didn't make the weight. Like, and that that maybe just like built like a bigger, scarier version of you. Because I felt like you were like make you were punishing him for missing the weight. And like an, a, an even more nasty, that brought out an even more nasty side of your personality. Well, I'll tell you this, man, that last fight, there was a lot of stuff outside of the fight that um, I had to deal with. It seems like every single time I, I go into a fight, uh, life hits me a little bit harder than the fight does. Uh, 
I got sick the week of the fight where I was vomiting, puking, like on the toilet. Uh, I was pretty sick, like seriously sick. Um, then on the Tuesday before I flew out, I flew out on Wednesday. My dog I, w- was so sick. She is, she's had, she was battling cancer for a really long time and I had to put her down. And, uh, even through all that shit, I get to the venue. Um, the way I normally cut weight is in the tub. Mm-hmm. They don't have tubs. I had to do it a wholly different way. Like, but I made the weight and I was cutting weight with him. I saw him cutting the weight. I was suffering. I know what suffering looks like. I was in there fucking getting it done. He was fucking off. So I was a little annoyed with the fact, like nothing against the guy. He's a nice dude. Um, uh, like we, we, we shook hands afterwards and I have no, no problems with him, but I know what a tough weight cut looks like. His weight cut was not tough. And, yeah. uh, you know, so all that stuff combined, um, dude, I was going into that fight like, th- like dry heaving. Like I had such, so much shit, but I knew I had to turn something up on here in here and say, I wasn't going to lose. And I had to find a way to win. And I did that. Um, and I, you know, I, that was another thing, uh, in that particular fight, I learned a lot of lessons from a win, uh, I learned who I am and that I ain't going to just, even if life's shitting on me, I'm not going to roll over and quit. And, uh, that's a blessing that I got from, from God. I think he's put that in me and put my, in my, in my soul. So I'm grateful for that. That, I have to say, uh, that was my favorite fight of yours because, um, you did, I did talk to you shortly after the fight and you were like, dude, I wasn't feeling good. Um, I was sick. Uh, so I knew that going into it, like, okay, may not have been like at like peak athletic performance as you typically are, but you've still managed a way to fight and get one over convincingly on a scary dude uh gregorio's like a big scary guy um <laughs> he he is he's huge i I'm, I'm just like jesus christ like that that guy is fucking like a great a greek god um <laughs> and for you to like get a fight against a caliber of opponent like that that to me was a coming out party of sorts that to me was an affirmation that no i'm serious i can beat guys like this um and the fact that I, I, I almost kind of feel in a way it was kind of one of those, like, wh- who do we have in this Michael Stack guy? Wh- wh- what is this ki- What is this guy about? Let's make him fight this Gregorio guy. If he can beat him, then we know we got, we got somebody who's real serious. And you were able to do that, and you did it convincingly. And with that win, I was just – I was really happy to hear LFA 133. They, they put you up, um, and they're giving you a shot – um, that's got to be something really cool. And you must have been really excited to find out that you're getting this opportunity. Oh, man, I feel so blessed. And again, dude, like I said, I had every, I was sick. My dog died. Almost missed the flight going out there. I didn't tell you about that. Like a whole bunch of shit was going on. My opponent missed weight. He missed weight originally, but he was weighed in his first time. One, six, 150 points. That's, point. that's, that's almost terrible. Hey, bro. Uh, I asked him to get to 148. He gets to 148, six, and I said, I'll still fight you. But, um, you know, I took a risk in doing that. My management was telling me to that I could pull out. Even the LFA guys were saying, hey, man, like, we we understand, like, this is a big mi- weight uh, miss. That's a, that's a big miss, yeah. You can, you can pull out of this fight if you'd like. And I was like, fuck that, man. I, I put too much work. I put too much time. I had to put my dog down because I – I didn't know if I came back, if she'd, you know, I didn't want her to suffer. So there's a whole lot of shit. And I, I think I learned a lot about myself from that. And I think, um, you know, taking that fight and winning it earned me this shot. And I, I'm appreciative that other people saw that, saw it that way as well. You know, I, the, the LFA. So, Hey man, I, this is a great opportunity. Mike, before I let you go, I want to ask you just not so much about the upcoming fight on the third but more so like getting winning a championship at this level of your career like you're just getting started in your professional career and you have this opportunity and 
Can you just explain like what would it mean for you at this point in your career to get that around your waist, to be called a champion at a professional level? That's got to be something that you've thought about since the very first time you walked into a gym and hit pads for the very first time. It's something that's like up here. And on June 3rd, it's going to turn into like a reality. Can you just talk a little bit about like, what is that going to mean for you and your family? Hey, look, man. It's not just a, a professional championship. It's a world championship. I win this LFA title. I am a world champion. And uh, yeah, man, that's a huge fucking thing for me. Like this, this shows to like, I was talking to some teammates at the gym. When you win the LFA title, you did not have an easy road there. Like they didn't give you a uh, uh, easy to get there. Right. They, you had to earn your way to get to it. And um yeah, it means that I, I earned it and I am a world champion and I am ready for that next level. And that next level is the UFC. So when I grab this title, I know that I'm ready for the big show. And I know that uh, the competition that I face in the big show, I'm prepared for. That's what that means to me. I'm like, yeah, man, it's going to be amazing feeling to have that that belt around my uh, my waist and just know that. I'm one of the best in the motherfucking world. <laughs> That's hey, uh, you know what? And it's, uh, it wasn't something that you just like woke up and decided to do today. This has been years in the making and there are the thousands, the tens of thousands of hours that are happening behind the scenes for you to prepare and get ready for this, not getting paid for bouts, getting paid a couple hundred bucks to fight. Like there's the amount of sacrifice that's happening behind the scenes in order to make this, a possibility like that's not lost on me i don't think anyone is ever really going to truly know what that's like unless they do it but i have a pretty good idea um you know needless to say you're not getting paid a million dollars to uh to win on the third but i know it's close <laughs> it's gonna feel like i'm winning a million dollars Absolutely. And um, mike i want to give you the opportunity because i like to do this uh, at the very end of my shows I know that you have a lot of people that work with you um, that support you and make this train keep going. So if there's somebody that you would like to uh, thank or shout out or anything like that, I want to give you the chance to do that. Hell yeah, man. I appreciate it. Uh, First of all, I would appreciate if some of your viewers would uh, follow me on Instagram at Michael stack underscore MMA. Um, I also have a, uh, my own clothing company that I run it's uh, filthy street apparel. So, you know, what that's kind of about is uh, like we talk about, man, you got to get a little filthy. You got to go grind. You got to get, put that work in to, to do filthy shit, right? Like have some filthy combinations, filthy tricks, what it is, whatever it is. uh, You got to get a little filthy to get, get it done. So uh, filthy streetwear.com is my website. You can also buy some of my Michael stack fight shirts on there. Um, so check that out. And then, you know, obviously I want to say thanks to my coaching, you know, uh, Ryan Schultz, Steve Peters, Justin Hofton over at, uh, pound for pound trials, MMA, and even high altitude mixed martial arts. Like those guys have been, uh, you know, great resources and great, um, just coaches and, and, and friends. So, you know, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been, it's been fun. Absolutely. The link to uh, Filthy Streetwear. I'm going to go ahead. I will put that in the description for this video. And I'm on the website right now. You might notice a couple of people that uh, are on this website. They may have been on my show in the past. I'm not going to give away any spoilers. You'll have to check that out and see for yourself. Please go and uh, support Mike. Fighting is, um, I can't think of a sport that is like more paywalled then fighting, not just if you're a fan of it, but it's a pay to play sport. And I promise you, they are paying more than what they're getting at this point in their career. So any single thing that you could do, even if it's just a follow up, makes a huge difference. I appreciate your time, Mike. And I'm looking forward to having you back on my show when you have that big belt, like, you know, absolutely man, right, right up there, man. So Mike, appreciate your time, my man. And we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Tyler. It's been a pleasure, man.